Well, hi, it's uh, good to be back around God's Word again. Throughout December, I've shared a series of messages around the theme uh, reflection. Uh, that's kind of our key word. And, and the, the idea is that how we see ourselves matters. It makes a difference how we travel through life, how we interact with, with other people, how we interact with God. And, and so many people have distorted views of themselves. Um, and, and they're distorted because they, not because they differ from the way other people see them. Sometimes that's the tragedy is that the, the distorted view is exactly how other people see us but they're distorted because they differ from the way that God views us. And so my purpose in this series has been to share a glimpse of the alternative lenses through which God looks at us. His lenses are often different than the ones that we use to look at ourselves. Now, if you've been around Lawson Road for any length of time, I hope you have heard often the two great commands, love God and love neighbor. Those instructions come straight from Jesus' mouth and are vital to a vibrant life as a follower of Jesus. However, before we even get to those great commands, there's a great truth that we need to have buried deep within us. And it's very simple. It's just that God loves you. To put it another way, you are loved. At this time of year, it's, it's Christmas. And love, it seems, is everywhere. We're inundated with messages of love. Uh, it, it might be the cards that you receive from people that you barely remember. Or it could be couples in commercials who are buying each other cars as expressions of their love. Maybe it's those ads for expensive jewelry. Um, perhaps it's Hallmark movies or numerous Christmas songs that just talk about um, being with the one you love. Or maybe it's just the experience and the, the longing to be with family. Love is everywhere. Or at least it's, it seems that it's supposed to be everywhere. Not everyone, however, who looks in a mirror sees the reflection of someone who's loved. Perhaps the the person looking at the mirror has withdrawn from, from family and they're, they've isolated themselves. But even if there's family out there who, who love them, uh, they don't experience that love because of the distance between them for whatever reason. I'm not trying to apportion blame there. Um, perhaps it's mental illness that clouds that reflection in the mirror. And, and, and gives a message that says that the individual is unlovable, that there's nothing redeeming about them. Sometimes addiction and isolation create walls uh, uh, with everyone around a person. Or maybe abuse and exploitation are the only reality a person knows, either giving or receiving can equally create that unloved experience. And so I know that when I say the simple phrase, you are loved by God, that it, it may be commonplace to many of us, but someone needs to hear this today. And, and maybe it's someone watching, maybe it's someone that you know, and, and maybe you just haven't said that to, to anyone lately, that, that they are loved. I'm not going to get into the fine details of biblical doctrine today about the mystery of God becoming flesh, although I do love that, that conversation. 
Uh, I love the, the reading that we had earlier that uh, from Luke 2, just the, the story of everything that took place around the birth of Jesus, um, the, the angels appearing to the shepherds, the shepherds coming into town. I wonder what Mary thought when they arrived um, there at, at her bedside. Um, perhaps the last thing that she wanted at that moment in time. But uh, with all of that going on, I want to give you just simply three biblical images that remind us that God loves us. Because I think we all need reminders at time, times. Uh, the first one, naturally, is the manger. And, and so we're familiar with the uh, nativity scene. We have the, the stable, the manger with the baby in it. We have Mary and Joseph there. And in and of itself, it doesn't communicate a message. Okay, it just says that a child was born. And so we, we, have to, we do have to do more reading. We have to know the rest of the story to understand the significance of that scene. In the book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7, we have this description of that manger of what it is is that that motivated Jesus to to be laying there as a newborn infant there the Apostle Paul writes that Christ Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness the manger represents when just as you're driving around town you see all these manger scenes in different places and and they're they're nice and they're comforting and they're familiar and they're cute and they're warm and fuzzy but but they represent god making himself nothing that terminology i think is really striking uh, some translations say god emptied himself but the terminology is so striking because for those of us who feel like nothing, Jesus became nothing to live with us. It says that for Jesus to become nothing, he became human. Now, as a human, most of us probably feel that life isn't too bad. Um, there are different degrees of humanity and and comfort and significance in life and most of us we we have family we have jobs we have some degree of significance in some social circle but Jesus left a place that was so great he gave up a position that was so high that his birth becoming human was him becoming nothing and it wouldn't have mattered if he was born in a palace or a stable he was still emptying himself becoming nothing and he did so for our benefit because he loves us because he believes that you are worth it and so the manger reminds us that God became nothing because he loves us the second is the church the church is a, a symbol if you will of um, the body of Christ, but it's a reminder of how Christ loves us. In Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 25 through 27, we have a description there of Jesus and the church. And Jesus is described as a bridegroom who is married or marrying the church, his, his bride. And this is an image that goes back to the Old Testament. Uh, the prophet Hosea, other prophets use this imagery of God and Israel, of, of Israel being the bride of God. And that sort of transfers to the church. And, and the the importance of that imagery is that it tells us that um, of the love, you know, that, that on a wedding day of a bridegroom and a bride, that their eyes are glowing, their eyes are only on each other, their smiles on their faces, and, uh, and, and the person opposite them is perfect at that moment in time. And, and that Jesus loves the church 
in that way as a, a husband and a wife love each other on their wedding day and and it's described that the wording is like this in Ephesians 5 verse 25 Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her you see Christ as a bridegroom isn't just a stereotype of a husband on a or, or a groom at his wedding Christ is the pinnacle of what it means for um, husbands to love their wives to to be committed and dedicated to their marriage and and so Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her from the moment that sin entered the world God began a plan to fix what was broken Jesus began planning his life as a, a man living on earth but the grand plan of history doesn't end at the manger as miraculous and as wonderful as the manger is that's not the end of the story it's a new beginning and so the birth of Jesus quite rightly captures our imagination as this as God explodes into human history in un, in, un, in unprecedented uh, ways as as God in the flesh I, I think of the angels appearing to the shepherds as as heaven exploding and and overflowing into the human realm and just celebrating that the redemption of humanity has begun but the plan continues beyond the birth it continues beyond the death it even continues beyond the resurrection of Jesus to include the church the bride of Christ but when we talk about the church we're not just saying that Jesus loves the institution the church I think there's some truth to that but Jesus also loves the people that make up the church and really it's remarkable to say that Jesus loves the church because churches are supposed to be these collections of of people that are redeemed that are following Jesus that are reflections of of God that embody Christ and all of his virtues and attributes that's that's what who churches are trying to the the description of the churches are trying to live up to but instead churches including Lawson Road uh, are filled with messed up people like me and you that are still trying to work out our lives and trying to work out what it means to follow God and and how to follow God in my circumstances and in your circumstances and it looks different for all of us and we churches aren't always kind and loving churches don't always make good decisions churches don't have 100 percent of the truth of the teaching of god churches don't always welcome and include everyone that they should but jesus recognizes us all as work in progress and he loves us anyway and he loves us as Ephesians 5 says so that at the end of time he can present her the church to himself as a radiant church without sin or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless that's our goal that's what we're moving towards and at the end of the time we'll end of time we will um, live up to that in the meantime life is messy church is messy but Jesus loves us and it's only at the end that we will fully reflect Jesus in the meantime we're always loved the church and the people in the church and then the third point i don't know if it's an image so much but in first john chapter 4 verses 8 and 9 we have this uh, definition we're told god is love and so god is defined as, as love or 
maybe it's love that is defined as God because love comes from God. But the Apostle John reiterates here that the birth of Jesus demonstrates the love that God has for us. As he looked back, John is writing late in in the first century, 50 years after the death of Jesus. And, And there were so many things that he could have written about. He'd been there with Jesus during his ministry. And he says this, God is love. And he sent his son as an expression of that love towards humanity. And so if God is love, and if Jesus is one with the Father, then it stands to reason that Jesus is also love. And so my final point, I I want to read uh, the, the passage that is read at so many weddings. We were just talking about the church as the the bride of Christ. And that is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But I want us to think of it today as an expression, uh, a description, not of love in general, but a description of Jesus. And so as I read it, don't think of this in a theoretical way or just, oh, love is out there or love is that's such a high standard or it's so idealistic. But think of it as this is Jesus. This is real. This is Jesus is the embodiment of all that is loving. And so Jesus as love is God letting you know that when life in a broken world with its broken systems is hurtful, is abusive, is lonely, is confusing, that you are still loved. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy and does not boast. Jesus is not proud. Jesus does not dishonor others. Jesus is not self-seeking. Jesus is not easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. Jesus does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. He always protects, always trusts, always hopes always perseveres. Jesus never fails. The Christmas story is a wonderful one. It's a series of miracles. It's a collection of fulfilled prophecies. It's a ragtag bunch of unlikely heroes from a young pregnant girl about to be married to shepherds on the hills in the middle of nowhere to wise men magi traveling from who knows where and how far it was to visit a child and the greatest miracle of all is that this story, these events, these people, everything comes together because God loves his creation. He loves humanity and he loves you. Even, or maybe especially, he loves when we feel unloved or unlovable. And so that this great truth can give you comfort and peace this Christmas, whether you're near to people who love you or not. And if you feel isolated, if you feel alone or hopeless, please call myself, call the elders, call someone you know who is a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And because it's our purpose for existing as a church 
to let the world, to let you know that God loves you, that you are loved. And so as you see all of these manger scenes, wherever carols you hear, and, and some of them are biblical and some are just seasonal, whatever it is, use them not to, um, to make you feel that you're missing out, but use them as one of those videos we watched earlier said. Use, use those events, those, those um, reminders to say, yes, God loves me. Bum bum